listening to Shortwave from NPR. Maddie Sophia here. Today's episode is about a scientific expedition to the top of the world. Reporter Ravenna Koenig is here to tell us all about it. Hey, Ravenna. Hey, Maddie. All right, let's not waste time. Tell me where it starts. So this expedition that started back in September in Tromsø, Norway, which you should really look on a map. It's way up there. Trumps is where I first stepped onto this massive German ice-breaking ship called the Polar Stern, where around 200 people were moving massive amounts of equipment on board, unpacking instruments, and starting to install and test them. One of the people involved in all this activity was Matthew Shoup, a scientist with the University of Colorado and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Excited and nervous. I, I'm both of those things. And Shoup is a co-coordinator for this endeavor, which, for this part at least, involves two ships. It's known as, are you ready for an acronym? Mm-hmm. <laughs> the Multidisciplinary Drifting Observatory for the Study of Arctic Climate, or MOSAIC. You know what scientists are good at, Ravenna? What are they good at, Maddie? Science. <laughs> Do you know what they're bad at? Acronyms? Yep, nailed it. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So that brings us to why the boat was actually being packed up in Norway. It's headed for the northmost section of the Arctic? Correct. And the reason why is that as the Arctic has warmed over the past few decades, the sea ice on the Arctic Ocean has gotten thinner, and it now covers a lot less area. Mm. So the overarching question that these scientists are trying to answer is, what are the causes of diminishing Arctic ice, and what are the consequences? As we have a thinner ice pack, That changes the way that energy transfers through the ice. It changes how the ice breaks up, how the ice moves around. So there's so many different kind of new behaviors of the ice because it's taking on a new character that we really need to study. Here's the best part. To do all that, the Mosaic team had to find an ice flow that they could freeze their boat in next to (laughs) and spend an entire year studying. So today on the show, part one of a two-part look at science and life aboard the Mosaic Expedition and what one year on a frozen ocean could teach us. Support for this podcast and the following message come from the Jason Carter Clinical Trials Program, helping patients with blood cancers and blood disorders find and join a clinical trial. Offering a search tool, support, and financial grants. Visit jcctp.org slash NPR. Support for this NPR podcast comes from Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. Family owned, operated, and argued over since 1980. Proud supporter of independent thought. Whether that's online, over the air, or in a bottle. More at sierranevada.com. Okay, Ravenna, before we hear some iceberg crackling, let's explain (laughs) why Arctic sea ice is so important scientifically. Right. So in the Arctic, the sea ice, the atmosphere in the ocean, they're, they're all linked. When the sea ice in the Arctic changes, it could mean a cascade of effects on everything from how clouds are formed to how much carbon dioxide is being mm. absorbed by the ocean to how organisms that depend on the ice are functioning. Right. And we know the Arctic is changing, right? Like big time. Yeah. And scientists need to understand how so they can better reflect the region in climate models. But there's a catch. What these scientists are about to attempt, it is really tricky. Here's what the leader of the Mosaic mission said to me. Um, I think we'll find a nice situation, but it's not clear yet. And I'm nervous about it, of course. That's exactly how I hoped he would sound. Yeah, his name is Marcus Rex. Getting better. Keep going. So Marcus told me this whole plan to study one chunk of ice by basically getting stuck in it, this really doesn't happen without finding a relatively thick piece of ice. We want to have a stable platform for our research city. Um, for that, we would like to have a flow that is at least a meter, better, a meter 20 thick. That's like three to four feet. Mm. If all they cared about was ice thickness, they could have gone to a different part of the Arctic where there's still some remnants of thicker ice left. Sure. But because they want to understand the thinner ice of this new Arctic, they had to try to find something that was thick enough in a thinner area. Not an easy balance to strike. And then even after they find it, they still face some really big challenges. What kind of challenges are we talking about? The main one is that the ice flow that they pick could break up or mm. melt out before the year is up. Then there's a chance this piece of ice could wind up taking them somewhere they don't want to go. Too close to Russia, where they're actually not allowed to take measurements, or a spot called the Beaufort Gyre. That's a large gyre of uh, ice where the ice just circles around for many years north of Greenland and north of Canada. We don't want to get stuck in that. 
I don't see what the problem is with an eternal circle of ice, Ravenna, <laughs> but go on. It's not for me. But the good news is Mosaic used over a decade of satellite data to help them figure out where they should start to best avoid getting taken to those places. But they still needed to find a piece of ice they thought would last a year. So we cast off from Norway, and this is what it sounded like when the polar stern left the dock. Ah. <laughs> yeah, that tracks for a big boat. Okay. Oh, it it's was still very going. loud in my ears, too. It's yeah, still going, huh? For it. It's still going. Yep. <laughs> I didn't expect it to come back. So I was traveling on a support vessel that was helping out. It's a Russian ship called the Academic Fedorov, and we left the next day with, sadly, no fanfare. <laughs> but we did all go out onto the deck and wave goodbye to a handful of people who were on the dock. Oh, it's Nina. Bye, Nina. Hashtag who's Nina. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> And we began this five-week trip, sailing way up into the Arctic Circle, looking for the start of the ice. It took us five days to get to the edge of it. We actually wound up getting there on an evening when we were having a party. We knew that we could expect the ice pretty much at any moment, and people kept going out to look. Anticipation was pretty high. Do you see anything? I don't see anything. There's no. nothing out there? <laughs> no. Is that you? Yeah. It just looks like water. You're so sad. I know I sound really sad. Uh, that's me feeling pretty disappointed after one of the guys on the ship, his name is Falk Ebert, came running in to tell everyone he'd seen a piece of ice. But when the rest of us went out there, there was nothing to see, just darkness. So not a super fun moment to be Falk. <laughs> I don't see anything. Oh, come on, I lose all my credibility. And then finally... Oh, the there's ice. ice. Oh. <laughs> yeah, right there, yeah. Tell me what you're looking at. Tell me what you're looking at. Uh, it looks like white and it stays there, so it's another wave. So it's the student Mauro Herman was explaining how it's easy to confuse a little piece of ice with white caps of ocean waves because obviously they're both white. Mm -hmm. But white caps disappear, chunks of ice don't. I, I thought I might cry actually when I first saw sea ice. I was quite worried, but I don't think I am going to cry. I think I'm just excited, <laughs> which is good. I was this worried. is another student, Robbie Mallet, and he talked about the sea ice like an endangered species, which in a lot of ways it is. It's such a precious resource that it's not going to go in the winter a while, but for a while, but. It's certainly going to change. Yeah, we're, we're privileged to be here and see it, I suppose. It's got to be kind of a confusing mix of emotions. For sure. Um, but as we got further north, we did start to see bigger and thicker ice flows. Even though they weren't as thick as they might have been decades ago, they were still really impressive. This one day sticks out where we tested the thickness of an ice flow by driving through it. So you're just smashing through it? Yeah. And where we were at this point, the ice was so consolidated and vast, it looked almost like land, like snow-covered land stretching out to the horizon. So what you're hearing there is the sound of the hull making contact with the ice and these chunks the size of couches and cars breaking off and turning over in the water. It was honestly one of the most amazing things that I've ever seen. But... Okay, I thought the plan was to get stuck in the ice. This sounds very much like smashing the ice. Right. So they actually thought that this flow was too close to where the ice meets the water, and they were worried that waves could break it up. But they thought that the thickness could be representative of other ice flows further north, which is why they wanted to check it out. And that's actually where the hunt went next. Teams went out by helicopter and snowmobile to gauge ice thickness at different spots. They were using airborne sensors and taking direct measurements with drills. This feels like movie science. You know what I mean? Like science in the movies with the helicopters. <laughs> Anyway, after three days of this, the picture didn't look great. They're all, they're all not looking very promising. They're all very thin. That's Thomas Crumpen, a sea ice physicist who was part of the search. And remember how earlier I said that finding the perfect patch of ice was no sure thing? Yeah, yeah. Well, so even on some of the thicker ice flows, only the top foot or so was solid, stable ice. Underneath there was this layer, they call it rotten, mm. meaning it's degraded and slushy. And there are different factors that could explain why the ice in this area was so thin this year, but it's pretty clear that Decades ago, this kind of weakness in the ice would have been far less likely. There is a change that can be related to Arctic warming. Ice is getting thinner. Ice is retreating further north. So did you eventually find some good ice? Yes. Welcome, everybody. So I have some good news. Uh, so 11 days after we left Norway, Crumpen announced that the team on the other ship had found a piece of ice that they thought would work. 
Even though parts of it were thin, it had a centerpiece of thicker ice, in some places 13 to 16 feet. Really, it's like a hidden treasure. And I must say that we can be quite lucky that uh, something like this was discovered. So, great. Um, So great. (laughs) <laughs> That's some science joy right there. So they decided this was the place where the expedition would hook into the ice for the year. But finding this ice flow is just the start of a long road of challenges. OK, so they found their ice. That was about two months ago. Have you heard how things are going? So since I've been back on land, I've actually gotten an update. Storms are one of their biggest worries. And in November, a storm caused some pretty major breaks in the ice. Things have since refrozen, but it really just underscores what's so important and so challenging about this whole expedition. The reason it's important to study the Arctic is that it's changing so rapidly. Mm -hmm. But that same rapid change may also make it more challenging to study. And that's what we'll talk about in the next episode, part two of your reporting, Ravenna. We'll explain what scientists are actually trying to study on the Mosaic expedition and how it could help us understand climate change. So, Ravenna, we'll see you again soon. Sounds good. I'm Maddie Safaya. Thanks for listening to Shortwave from NPR. Listening to Shortwave from NPR. Maddie Safaya here. Today, the second of our two part adventure to the middle of the Arctic Ocean, where scientists are freezing a ship into the ice for a year to study how the region is changing. On Friday, we talked about how the expedition tracked down their hard-to-find piece of ice. And today, we'll be talking about what happened once they found it. Reporter Ravenna Koenig is our guide. Hey, Ravenna. Hey, Maddie. And would you just remind us the mouthful name of this thing? Sure. It's called the Multidisciplinary Drifting Observatory for the Study of Arctic Climate, or MOSAIC. I guess uh, mm, Dozaic did not (laughs) have the same ring, I guess. I guess not. (laughs) So you're back on land in Seattle now, but you joined this expedition for five weeks as it left a port in Norway. There's that horn. (laughs) There's that horn. And it sailed up north. That's right. And on board were scientists from all kinds of fields of study, all joining forces to undertake the most comprehensive look at Arctic sea ice in 20 years. (laughs) That's what it sounded like as our boat plowed through the sea ice as we looked for an ice flow that was thick enough to call home base for an entire year. That ice, of course, is slowly shrinking as the Arctic gets warmer. And the primary question Mosaic is trying to answer is, what are the causes of that diminishing Arctic ice, and what are the consequences? So today, a look at the physics, chemistry, and biology on the Mosaic expedition. Support for this podcast and the following message come from the Jason Carter Clinical Trials Program. Helping patients with blood cancers and blood disorders find and join a clinical trial. Offering a cert tool, support, and financial grants. Visit jcctp.org slash NPR. Support also comes from Bayer. Bayer is helping advance stem cell therapy to repair heart tissue to keep hearts stronger, longer. From advances in health to innovations in agriculture, Bayer is advancing science for a better life. At Bayer, this is why we science. Okay, Ravenna, so we're going to dig into the science Mosaic is doing in a second. But first, I just have some, you know, basic human questions about what it was like living on a ship for over five weeks. (laughs) Paint us a picture. Yeah. uh, So we were on this Russian research vessel that was assisting with the setup of the experiment. It was a pretty big ship, over 450 feet, longer than a football field. It's a lot of boats. It's a lot of both. Uh, there were about 80 some other expedition folks on the ship as well. Scientists, grad students, a few other journalists, and then the crew, who were all Russian. <laughs> we were really in our own world. We could get WhatsApp messages and some limited emails, but there was no Googling, no Netflix, no cell service. So it was the late 90s is what you're telling me? <laughs> Basically the late 90s. You had to like, sometimes you would have to like arrange to meet somebody somewhere on the ship. Like I had that experience of of being like, okay, I'll see you in such and such a place at Mm -hmm. such and such a time. And then you just have to be there. That sounds Um, hard. But this was my first time living on a ship like this. And honestly, I had a lot of questions in the beginning about just how to do that. And I was not the only one. What's the procedure for vomiting? (laughs) Best to do it in your toilet? Yeah. 
in the toilet, right? God, I love scientists so much, Ravenna. What What is the procedure for vomiting on this boat? Well, I didn't vomit, and I actually don't know anybody else who did because, you know, we by the time we got to the ice, things actually evened out. So there was only a part at the beginning where things were really wavy. But, yeah, like in your toilet, overboard, it was sort of an open question. And the person asking it that you just heard was ice expert Michel Samados, who was also out on his first expedition at sea. Um, there was also a learning curve for other stuff. Some of it was Russian-specific, like how to say hello. Russian ice specialist Anna Timofeeva taught us some of that. If you want to be more polite, you should say Здравствуйте. Okay, Здравствуйте. Great. And then just getting to know all these new people who we were living with in the small space for weeks on end. We had basically three common rooms to hang out in, and we shared our cabins with at least one other person. So we were around each other a lot. Yeah, sounds sounds a little tight, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, at times it did feel small, but, um, you know, we were also in the middle of this spectacular ice wilderness. So we spent a lot of time on deck just sort of gaping at this gorgeous landscape. And we saw all kinds of amazing things, um, like, for example. Polar bears. Polar bears bears (laughs) padding along in the distance on the ice the ship was driving through. And then a few times we saw the northern lights. Oh, wow, look at that streak right there. Just like bright filaments of light, very dynamic across the sky. It's super cool. My jealousy knows no limits, Ravenna. The Northern well, Lights. <laughs> the Northern Lights. It was pretty cool. <laughs> okay, so you're in the Arctic Ocean, seeing bears, looking for a piece of ice to basically dock into. You find it. Then what? So on the Polar Stern, the German icebreaker that's going to be drifting with the ice for the whole year, mm-hmm. they started setting up this huge science camp on that main flow that they picked. Meanwhile, on my vessel, the scientists geared up to put out this network of scientific equipment on different pieces of ice around that central point. They range from like a mile and a half to about 30 miles away from it. And those will give them context for the measurements they're taking at the main site. Gotcha. So you actually went out onto the ice and talked to them about what they were collecting. I did. We would line up at the start of the day and sign out of the ship's logbook. That's me, K-O-E-N-I-G, Ravenna. Uh, okay, thank you. You can go in on ice. Okay. And then we'd go down these big metal stairs to the ice. Where all these scientists were working at different stations to install equipment that will help them better understand the warming Arctic. Up into the hole. You're in down, Chris. So just to underscore the context here, the Arctic has changed a lot over the past few decades. It's warming twice as fast as the rest of the world, and all the ice that used to be on the Arctic Ocean year-round is shrinking, and it's getting a lot thinner. That's right. And scientists want to better understand how this new Arctic works, but that's a super complex puzzle. So hundreds of researchers will be on the Mosaic expedition digging into different pieces of that puzzle over the next year. Mm -hmm. One of them is an ocean physicist whose voice you heard a second ago. He's got a great accent and an even better sense of humor. His name's Tim Stanton. Okay, I've got to just get the hairdryer. Oh, a hairdryer? Well, it's an electrical, what do you call it, heat gun. It will frizz your hair, that's for sure. (laughs) Tim was using the heat gun to warm up electrical connectors on a science buoy that he was installing. Science buoy. Science buoy, that's the official name. It was a pretty chilly day, the day I was out on the ice with him, about 18 degrees Fahrenheit. And the buoy took about eight hours to put into place on the ice, which is a normal work day in an office, but outside in those temperatures, it's pretty grueling. Yeah, that, that's some real commitment to the advancement of knowledge right there. I appreciate it. But the cool thing is that once Tim installed the buoy, it operates more or less independently out there throughout the year. It collects data from all sorts of scientific bells and whistles that hang below it in the water. The flux package mounts on here, and that's what measures the transport of heat, salt, and momentum in the water column. Heat, salt, and momentum. What's he talking about here, Ravenna? Right. So sea ice is made up of water that is less salty than ocean water. So as it melts in the summertime, it contributes fresher water to the top of the ocean. The difference in salinity or saltiness between those two layers can make a barrier that traps that melted ice water at the top of the ocean. And if that water gets trapped, Stanton thinks it can absorb a lot more heat from the sun and lead to even more melting of the ice. You can get these Uh, fresh warm layers that when a little bit of wind comes along does a little bit of mixing really melts the heck out of the ice. He thinks this might play an important role in why the sea ice is disappearing as fast as it is. 
Interesting. Okay. So you've got this guy looking specifically at like ocean saltiness or salinity. What are other sorts of things people are digging into? So like I said, there are hundreds of scientists working on this thing. They're looking at the ocean, the atmosphere, and the ice from the perspectives of physics, chemistry, and biology. Because all those things are linked together, if one is changing, it's potentially leading to changes in others. I'll give you an example, or I'll let this lady do it. <laughs> My friends always joke that I'm Dr. Cloud. Dr. Cloud, also known as Jesse Cremian. You know, every atmospheric scientist who does clouds has like their list of favorite clouds. For the record, her favorite clouds are Kelvin Helmholtz clouds, which look like ocean waves. Very respectable choice. Very respectable choice. So Jesse's particular focus is actually these tiny particles in the atmosphere that help clouds form. They're called aerosols. And I watched her test a device she'll be using to collect and count those aerosols out on the ice. Little aerosol sampler. Do well today. <laughs> aerosols can be dust, pollen, fungi, just to name a few. And in the Arctic, scientists think they can also come from tiny organisms in the water, like bacteria or algae. Okay, so how does this connect back to ice? Well, Jesse's hypothesis is that if there's open water where ice used to be, it could mean more of these tiny particles in the ocean could get blown from the ocean into the atmosphere and see more clouds. And clouds actually play an important role in regulating temperature. That affects how much heat can basically help melt the sea ice or it can actually reflect sunlight from the sea ice. So it has a big role in controlling how much sea ice we have here. Okay, so we're looking at ocean salinity, cloud formation, hundreds of other scientists on this expedition doing their own very specific work. Help us understand how all of this adds up to better understanding climate change, not just in the Arctic, but like more broadly. It's a good question. And I'm going to enlist Matthew Shoup, one of the leaders of the expedition, to help answer it. This whole project is aimed at improving our models. So when Matthew says models, he means the computer simulation scientists use to get estimates for all kinds of things. One example is how much the Earth could warm in the next 50 years. The better you reflect reality in those simulations, the better prediction you'll get. That makes sense. But because this region is so logistically challenging and expensive to get to and to work in, there's a huge data gap there. Scientists will not stand for gaps in data, Rivetta. They will not. <laughs> they will not. But anyways, Matthew says as a result, the simulations for how the Arctic will respond to climate change vary a lot. The Arctic is a place where the models agree the least. Hmm. So that tells us that we're missing something. And so that's really what they're there to do. Try to nail down some of the missing pieces in their understanding of how the Arctic works so they can better represent it in models. So you mentioned how models help scientists project global temperature. Is the idea that this data will help them with that? Yeah, improving models will help with that and a bunch of other things. Some of them are regionally relevant, for example, improving ice forecasts on the Arctic Ocean. Mm -hmm. But then on a global scale, improving models means improving projections for things like how fast the Greenland ice sheet might melt, adding to global sea level rise. And then there's also this area of ongoing debate in the scientific community about how changes in the Arctic may affect mid-latitudes in other ways. As the Arctic is warming faster than the rest of the globe, that modifies the large-scale circulation and could lead to things like more extreme weather at lower latitudes. For example, some researchers think that the extreme cold temperatures the Northeast and Midwest United States saw last winter could be linked to changes in the Arctic. And they hope that the information collected on this expedition will contribute to a better understanding of those possible linkages. Big questions, Ravenna. Yeah, big questions. Ravenna, thanks so much for braving the cold and sacrificing the internet for 40 days <laughs> to bring us this story. Thanks for having me. And if you want to see reporter Ravenna Koenig's pictures from the Mosaic Expedition, they're up on npr.org. We have a link in our episode notes. I'm Maddie Safaya. Thanks for listening to Shortwave from NPR. <laughs>